Well, hello everybody, it's great to be with you. I am, uh, for the next four weeks, I am one of the pastors at the Spring Tempe. Um, and then I'm retiring, so Woo! I know. Woo! Um, and I'm also Luke's mom, and we try to help each other out when we need to help each other out. Um, but I am going to ask if you would wear a mask. I am one of those people that's a high-risk person. I have cancer, and um, I'd like to take mine off, and if you wear yours, I'll feel safer. So thank you for that. I am um, going to tell a story I don't know if you've heard it before, but it's a story that Eugene Peterson tells about um, him learning kind of the hard ropes of, of life. And he learned it early on when he went to, he started at school. He met the school bully on about the third day of school, and the bully's name was Garrison Johns. He was a year older than him, but he spotted Eugene Peterson, and he would chase him um, and catch up with him every day after school, almost every day after school, and beat him up. And Eugene talks about how he would go home and be bruised and humiliated, and his mom would say something like, well, honey, you know, Christians have suffered, you know, from the beginning of time and just going to have to get used to it. And he had memorized prayers in his set, or passages of scripture in Sunday school like, blessed are those who persecute you and um, pray, for, pray for your enemies and turn the other cheek. And so he tried to do that. Until one day in March. And on this particular day, Harrison caught up with him after school and um, he he was there with seven or eight of his friends. And this is what he says. That's when it happened. Something snapped within me, totally uncalculated, totally out of character. For just a moment, the Bible verses disappeared from my consciousness, and I grabbed Garrison. To my surprise and his, I realized I was stronger than he. I wrestled him to the ground, sat on his chest, pinned his arms to the ground with my knees. I couldn't believe it. He was helpless under me, at my mercy. It was too good to be true. I hit him in the face with my fists. It felt good, and I hit him again. Blood spurted from his nose. By this time, all the other children were cheering, egging me on. Black his eyes, bust his teeth. I said to Garrison, say uncle, and he wouldn't say it. So I hit him again, more blood, more cheering. Now the audience was bringing out the best in me. And then my Christian training reasserted itself, and I said, Say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it. <laughs> Garrison Johns was my first convert. <laughs> we're in a series of sermons that we're calling Spiritual Conversations. And that's a, we don't want you to do what? <laughs> That's a negative example. But we do want you to share the good news of the gospel. God wants you to share the good news of the gospel because it's the hope of the world. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for how you have worked throughout history for your servants. Would you speak to us Would you use us in mighty ways? Would you grow us? I pray that the words that I speak would be faithful to your words and that it would not be turned away. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. It's because of the resurrection. In Acts from chapter 21 to 26, again and again, the apostle is beaten and arrested and imprisoned and um, and put on trial several times in Jerusalem and in Caesarea. It's because of the, of the hope of the resurrection that he came back to Jerusalem because he wanted the people there to know it. It, it was the truth of the resurrection that really was the kind of the linchpin of, of all of his testimony every time he was on trial. And it was the power of the resurrection that 
that fills him with this uh, indomitable courage and this passion to reach the world for Christ. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 26, and I'm, I'm actually going to pick up at the end of, of the story. I'll go back and fill in some of the blanks. But um, basically, he is on trial, and he's on trial before the governor, Festus, and also the, the king, Agrippa, and his sisters, who's also his wife, um, Bernice. And, um, and this is what he said toward, toward the end of the time. This is Acts 26, beginning at verse 22. To this day, I have had help from God. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. While he was making the defense, Festus exclaimed, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much learning is driving you insane. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking the sober truth. Indeed, the king knows about these things, and to him I speak freely, for I am certain that none of these things has escaped his notice for this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, are you so quickly persuading me to become a Christian? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am except for these chains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to back up. In the, in the chapter, just before chapter 26, he's on trial before Festus. And Festus just kind of doesn't know what to do with them. And so he says something about it to the king, and, and the king says, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to hear from him. So the scripture tells us with great pomp, the king and Bernice entered this great elegant hall. Just imagine them in their purple robes with this giant uh, kind of entourage as they enter. And then picture the Apostle Paul. Tradition tells us that he was a small man, balding, that he had really bushy eyebrows and a hook nose, and uh, he was bow-legged. But when he spoke, he, he cut through all the pomp and circumstance. He wasn't intimidated by the king. He wasn't overly impressed by him, and he wasn't afraid of him either. He begins by just telling his story. I was, uh, I was of the strictest of sex in, in, in Israel. I was a Pharisee. I, I persecuted, violently persecuted people who were Christians. And then on the road to Damascus, I saw this bright light. And the Lord gave me a heavenly vision. And he told me that I was called to proclaim the gospel to the whole world. Lloyd Ogilvie says that it must have been obvious that Agrippa was moved, um, disturbed, as, as Paul began to tell his story. That he was shaken by it. Agrippa was a a Jew, at least culturally, he, he knew the Jewish faith. But he had actually been completely assimilated into the Roman imperial culture. He was a part of the, of the family of the Herods, um, who, who have for generations, honestly, um, 
opposed to the truth and righteousness of God. His great-grandfather was the King Herod that had all of the children ages two and under, all the male children ages two and under um, killed because he was so threatened by the birth of Jesus. His grandfather was the, the, the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. His father was the Agrippa I, the Herod that um, executed James. It, that's his family. He, he, he was culturally a Jew, but he was very much a Herod. And he expected respect and, um, and enjoyed wielding his power. Perhaps Festus observed that. Perhaps he observed that, that the king was unsettled. And so Festus says, Paul, you're insane. You're just insane. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the fact that people may, may say you're insane. But you just tell the truth. And may your prayer be that all who are listening to you become like you are. They may say you're insane. That's what Festus said about Paul. You probably know that most of the, of the New Testament was written in Greek language. And the word for insane in Greek in the Bible is my name. Say that with me. My name. Insane. My Jewish relatives would say, you're Meshuga. Some of you may have grown up in a household where they would have said, estas locas. <laughs> right? My name. You're crazy. Was Paul crazy for believing in a suffering Messiah King? Are you crazy if you believe in a suffering Messiah King? Not this last Easter, COVID Easter, but the Easter before, I think it was Good Friday actually. I was in a, a nail salon and the, I was explaining to my Vietnamese nail tech that we were gonna worship that night because it was Good Friday, a big celebration on Easter. And, um, and I was telling her that, that I believe that on Good Friday, Jesus died on a cross, and, and, and it was for the forgiveness of my sins and all of our sins, and that he made a way for us to, to have a close relationship with God. But that he didn't stay dead, that God raised him from the dead on Easter Sunday, and, and that, that he's alive today, and he's at work in the world, and he's at work in my own life. I'm telling her this stuff, and... She looks at me like I am my name. <laughs> and she starts talking to the nail tech next to her in Vietnamese. And I just got to thinking, what is the word for insane in Vietnamese? <laughs> <laughs> so I looked it up. And I'm sure um, if you speak Vietnamese, this is a terrible pronunciation, but it's something like Dan Wong. I think she might have been saying to the nail tech next to her, she's Dan Huang. <laughs> You're insane, Paul. And Paul just says, no, I'm not insane. I'm telling you the sober truth. I'm pointing you toward hope. Hope in the one who brings light where there's darkness. Hope in the one who brings dead things and people to life. They may say you're insane, but he just tell the truth. It, he just told the truth. He told his own story. You tell your own story. 
How has God met you in your life? How is God meeting you in your life? Um, you tell some of God's story. And whatever is appropriate at that moment. Um, Paul is, is trying to tap into to the fact that Agrippa has Jewish roots. You just tell some of your of God's story. And, and obviously the heart of God's story, the, the, the pivotal point of God's story, is that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And his son gave his life on the cross so that we can have our sins forgiven. And he's, and he's not dead, he's alive. And he's at work in this world. And he's at work in our lives. Paul is, he's trying to connect with the group in particular. He's trying to connect with him. And he says, do you believe the prophets? Do you believe the promise? Because it, if, if a group of believes that, then he'll believe in a Messiah because the prophets told about that. So you can kind of see what Paul's, why Paul is trying to connect in this way in this particular situation. And he says to him, I'm saying only what the prophets and Moses said would take place. That the Messiah must suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. And he proclaimed light to our people and to the Gentiles. And then when Festus says you're insane, I think he, he just walks in on Agrippa. Mm -hmm. Do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. In this book, The Reluctant Witness, It's, it's a really good book. And in it, Don Eberts tells, um, talks about research that the Barner Group and Lutheran Hour Ministries did on Christians and non-Christians and spiritual conversations. It's called The Reluctant Witness, Discovering the Delight of Spiritual Conversations. They, in the research, divided Christians between what they call eager conversationalists and reluctant conversationalists. And they're talking about spiritual kind of conversations. They actually have a very broad definition of a spiritual conversation. Um, anything, it, it could be anything. If, if you leave here and you get in your car and you talk about something in the sermon today, they would have considered that having a spiritual conversation. So very, very broad. Their research showed that that, uh, that um, reluctant conversationalists, they considered had nine spiritual conversations or less in a year. And eager conversationalists had at least 10 or more. Many had 50 or more in a year. About three quarters of the Christians that they surveyed are reluctant conversationalists. And about a quarter of them are eager conversationalists. These are the habits of eager conversationalists. Habit one. Eager conversationalists look for and expect spiritual conversations in everyday life, at work, in any kind of social setting, on social media, over a coffee or a meal, or on trial before a royal court. <laughs> they look for and expect spiritual conversations. Habit number two. Eager conversationalists pursue and initiate spiritual conversations. Spiritual conversations help us go deeper with people, right? And so they want, they want to connect with people on a, on a deeper level than the weather today. <laughs> Paul did his best to initiate a conversation with Agrippa. Do you believe in the prophets? Now, Agrippa doesn't bite, but he was trying to initiate something there. Habit number three, eager conversationalists are open to sharing their faith in a variety of ways. They don't have a memorized script that they say in, 
in every situation. It's particular. This is a particular conversation with a particular person. And so the, the, the conversation varies accordingly. Paul's trying to zero in on, on Agrippa's Jewish roots and, and the prophets who, who said that a Messiah was going to come and bring in his kingdom. Habit number four, eager conversation was gently pushed through the awkward moments. I would guess it was awkward when Festus said that uh, Paul was insane. But he pushed through anyway, right? He, he pushed it a little further. Do you want to be, are you an eager conversationalist or reluctant one? First question. And my second one question is, would you, would you want to be an eager conversationalist if you're not? When I was a kid, my dad told me on numerous occasions, never, ever, ever talk about money, politics, or religion with people. Mm -hmm. My dad was absolutely convinced that those conversations would end up going south. But it's interesting, in this book, the research shows something very different. When they surveyed reluctant conversationalists, eager conversationalists, and the non-Christians that they spoke with, do you know what the overwhelming feeling was after they had a conversation? Peace. Peace. And a, and a close second, joy. Now, there were some conversationalists, conversations that people had where um, one of, or more of them felt um, negative feelings. But they're, when you look at the chart, they're just, they're minuscule compared to the, the overwhelming feelings of peace and of joy. It, it makes sense when you think about it. You know, psychologists will tell you that superficial talk, small talk, or shallow conversations don't lead to the same level of happiness that deep conversations do. There's, there's something in us that hungers, that, that longs for a deeper connection with people. In Paul's case, Agrippa can see what, where he's going. That if he says, yes, I believe in the prophets, that that means I believe there's a Messiah coming. And that would mean that I'd have to make a decision about Jesus and the resurrection. And he wants nothing to do with it. And so he says, Paul, are you so quickly trying to persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul, I love his answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know about quickly, but I like everyone, not just you, but everyone here who's listening to me to become as I am except for the chains. They may say you're insane, but you just tell the truth. And may you pray that everyone who hears would become like you are. Paul says, yes. Yes, thank you for asking. I, I am trying to persuade you to be like I am. Friends, if we can't say, I hope that you would become like I am, that you would know what I know about the love of Jesus, that you would be, be transformed the way I am being transformed as he continues to work in and through me. If, if you can't say that, you're missing the excitement of the Christian life. Agrippa has had enough. And they just get up right then and they walk out. There's, there's nothing they want to hear. And do you know what? Paul's not responsible for how they respond. 
And we're not responsible for how people respond when we just tell the truth. We're not. We just tell the truth. There is a there was a, a man who a pastor who went in a, to a cemetery in Italy, and it was um, he found there a, a very unusual grave. It was clearly a grave of a man who was not a Christian. Probably um, he was a, 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 against Christianity actually, and and maybe a little bit afraid of it. He had a, a massive stone put over his grave after he was buried. Because, get this, just in case there was a resurrection, he didn't want to be raised from the dead. <laughs> he had signs put on this massive stone grave that said, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. <laughs> Evidently, when he was buried, an acorn fell into the, to the grave. And by the time the pastor was, was there looking at it, a huge oak tree had, had grown from that acorn and had burst through the stone and become this huge tree. And the pastor said, he just stood there for a while and kind of meditated on it and was like, wow, if a, an acorn through this kind of just biological process could do that to a slab like that, what could the acorn of the power of the resurrection of God do in the life of a person? Friends, if, if, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, God gives you his Holy Spirit. And that's resurrection power. That's the power that raised God, the Christ, from the dead. Think about the seemingly immovable stone slabs in your life. Maybe uh, anxiety, or bitterness, or insecurity, or self-doubt, or, or whatever those things are. And, and the resurrection power of God, breaking through those, moving them out of the way. The, the longer we walk with God, the more we grow in, into that resurrection power. Think about Paul for a minute. Think about that statement. But I told you earlier in my sermon, he was beaten and arrested and imprisoned and put on trial again and again. And he says, I want you to become as I am, except without the chains. Now, what does he mean by that? Who is Paul without the chains? He's a man forgiven of, of all his sins, and some of them were pretty bad. He's a man with a clean conscience. He's a man with a passion to live into the calling that God has on his life. That's how he can say, I, I pray that everybody here listening to me today would become as I am. I pray that for everyone who's listening to me today, that you would become as I am. Not because I have it all together, not because I'm better than you, not because I'm perfect. God knows I'm so far from that. But I long for everyone who's listening to me today to know the love of Christ that has so gripped me. 
I long for you to know the transforming power of Christ who continues to work in me and in the world and through me. I want you to know that. It's because of the resurrection. That's why anything's possible, even if your dreams are crushed. Even if, even if, like me, sometimes your energy's depleted. Or if or your life is just unsettled right now. If you're in a time of change and you don't know where it's going. Because of the res resurrection, we know that we have a God who brings life. Always, always life. So the only question is, will you believe that? And will you share it? Pray with me.